Hello, hi everybody. My name is Angie. I'm part of the Horizon Labs team. And as um, just announced, we're gonna have a spotlight session uh, presented by Robert Biglioni. He is the CEO of Horizon Labs and co-founder of Horizon. So as mentioned previously, this session is gonna be about why haven't enterprises adopted, uh, adopted uh, blockchain and mass. So I hope that you enjoy it. And uh, please, let's welcome Rob to the stage. Thank you. All right, hello, good morning, everyone. I don't have a podium, so I'm gonna pace back and forth, my favorite thing to do. And it's 10 a.m. on a Friday after a lot of probably late night events last night. You guys are awesome for being here. And hopefully, this is gonna be worth your time. I think it will be. Uh, so I'm gonna talk with a, basically an intro presentation to set the stage. And then I'm gonna make sure that I stick to less than 15 minutes so we can bring in the amazing panel that we have. Okay, so uh, why haven't enterprises come on chain is, is really our topic. Some of them absolutely have, in fact a bunch have, and a lot of them, almost all of them, have been dabbling in crypto, have been dabbling in blockchain, have been dabbling in this DLT, distributed ledger technology thing for a long time. And yet, we still don't find all of our favorite apps on all of our different devices using crypto, right? So what's going on? Uh, I'll give you an intro, guys, of who I am, because I, I come from the original like, Bitcoin community, and I got into this world for probably a you know, very similar reason you know, that a lot of other early Bitcoin and crypto people got into it. We wanted to change the world, right? The big message of this technology, we're gonna bank the unbanked, we're gonna completely change the financial system, we're gonna change social systems, right, with this technology. And I absolutely believe that, but I have to say, uh, Bitcoiners are in already, they've been here for a while. ETH devs, Ethereum devs, have laid the foundations in the smart contract world to actually get infrastructure, get applications that are starting to dabble in different use cases some of them extremely important, most of them still kind of POC-like, right? And serving our, our own industry, right? We've got this little click in, in the grand scheme of things of crypto people and the applications, the technologies, the foundations that we've, we've laid thus far have really been catering to ourselves. Now, there's a big enterprise world out there and we've been, you know, hammering them ever since the beginning, basically after the, the early euphoria of Bitcoin and then the next set of cryptocurrency, you know, forks that hit the market, uh, and then a bunch of, you know, then DeFi hitting the market, we've been hammering enterprises and the broader public with the benefits of blockchain. Why we think the entire world is going to get on-chain one day, and I believe it, but the reality is they're not today, right? And probably another reality that we have to face is that we have a lot of frictions out there. So we have benefits, and we can probably all rattle off these benefits ourselves, right? Transparency, traceability, these are the things that having a public information commons can bring you. Security, you know, um, public key cryptography is a really important, uh, you know, field. Uh, we've got efficiency. We talk about, hey, we can replace back office functions in companies and enterprises and consortiums, right? Uh, with automated smart contracts, flexibility, composability. We all know the buzzwords, and they're not just buzzwords, they're actually real benefits that blockchains and Web3 bring to the world. But again, we have to ask ourselves the questions, why are we not there yet? Why has that future not materialized? And why instead he do we get headlines like this all the time? Years after, you know, uh, very uh, brave, uh, enterprises and consortia have tried out this technology, have tried different experiments, POCs have basically all spun up their own blockchain teams, right? And their blockchain teams are filled with really enthusiastic, you know, crypto people that happen to work for companies and enterprises out there and government agencies, right? These people aren't uh, naive to what we've brought out here. They probably have their own MetaMask wallets and digital assets, and they probably go home and use these technologies at night after they get off work. Right? And they're in these companies and they're driving these POCs, these experiments, and you know, these legitimate use cases. But why do we continue to see headlines like Maersk and IBM discontinuing uh, shipping blockchain platform? Why do we see the Australian Stock Exchange that bravely jumped into the world of blockchain retracting from that? Why do we see headlines like uh, you know, IBM blockchain being a shell of its former self after these guys were kind of the leaders of getting out there with private or enterprise blockchain solutions? So let's put it together, guys. And I didn't really give an intro to, to myself or to us, but 
beyond saying that I was an early Bitcoin enthusiast, uh, we have a company that's a Web3 company. We actually call it a crypto company. You can look at my attire up here tonight. I've got a crypto t-shirt on and trying to look mature with my jacket. Um, but really, what this signifies is it's just a symbol that I am the CEO of a crypto company. And I unabashedly say that, sometimes to the consternation of employees or customers. Right? We're a crypto company because I believe this technology really does offer the benefits that we say they do. I really believe that security, transparency, automated composability, access, you know, permissionlessness to get into a common infrastructure, or the idea of an information commons is real. These benefits will happen, guys. But let's be honest about where we stand. So I run a crypto company that has some of the most phenomenal successes over the last couple of years. We've deployed some of the most used smart contracts in the world on the fungible token side, the non-fungible token side, metaverse to you know, staking platforms. We've done it all. We're also protocol developers. We're also zero knowledge cryptography and other cryptographic engineering experts. It's kind of the core competency for who we are as a company. But still, now, what we're doing is we're tilting from the experiences that we've had in Web3 or traditional crypto before we started calling it Web3. Thank you, Gavin Wood, for coming up with an awesome term that can help galvanize the world around this new set of decentralizing technologies. But now we ask ourselves the hard questions. Now, like, like I said, the Bitcoiners are in, the ETH devs have laid foundations, and now we have to address the realities of why don't we have the next billion users in crypto? Why don't we have a billion users today in crypto building on these platforms that we say are amazing? So now my company is at a crossroads, one could say. Over the last six months, we've been retooling and actually taking our experiences from Web3, which have been awesome and fun and phenomenal from a business perspective, and now we're taking that to enterprise. We're gonna solve these problems systematically by addressing the hard truths of why, thus far, the world hasn't adopted our technologies. So let's just say, number one, kind of elephant in the room, guys, we've come a long way from Satoshi Nakamoto to Gary Gensler, right? This is a long journey that we've been on, and I can say that we've had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of missteps, and a lot of the early enthusiasts who had big visions and a lot of, um, uh, you know, like big ideal idealism, uh, a lot of that has been achieved, but we've also had really big missteps and headlines that I really hate seeing. I really hate seeing headlines of scams, frauds, and just straight up bad engineering or bad business practices where you take something to market without doing proper QA testing, and all of a sudden your users get completely you know, screwed in the end. So let's address our realities. Regulators are focusing the spotlight on this industry, in some cases for really good reasons, guys, and businesses don't want to generally operate in a regulatory gray zone. So this is reality, big reality number one that we have to face. So what do we do? As an industry, do we continue to just ignore regulators and say, who cares, we're building something completely different, it's orthogonal, they can't or shouldn't uh, touch what we're doing? I don't think so, my company's not doing that. We're addressing the realities that we face and we wanna work to actually bring the world of Web 2 into Web 3, or maybe more appropriately, bring Web 3 into Web 2 and make these technologies that actually have real value come in and augment, maybe in some cases replace, the technologies and just the systems that already work really well. And that's point number two. Web 2, you know, Web 2, you guys might smirk at me with this terminology, but you can consider this everything that's on that supercomputer in your pocket and all of the other services that you use all the time all of the supply chains and logistics chains that allow all of this to be a reality, that's Web 2, and it works pretty darn well. Civilization has come a really long way, guys, and over the last 50 years, 100 years, I mean, our lives are so much better than our grandparents could have ever imagined, right? So here we are, as uh, you know, a bunch of bright technologists just you know, flashing this you know, shiny object out there called Web 3 and saying, this is the future, guys, you should all come to us. I don't think so, I think we need to go to them. Uh, cryptocurrency volatility, guys. Again, big fan, you know, big fan of Bitcoin, big fan of ETH and, and Zen, a cryptocurrency that my company even like builds on and supports. You know, but the volatility sucks. It really sucks, and it's not something that I think should be part of an every user's experience out there with the apps in your pocket. You know, like you don't want to know as a merchant that you know, guess what? Your revenue flows don't match your expenses because they're in different currencies. You know, the average merchant doesn't want to be in the Forex business, guys. Right? That, that's a reality that we have. 
nor does the average user of you know, your social media platform want to pay a fee every time they like or retweet something. Right? That, that's just not the, the user experience reality that is going to make this technology stick. And still, privacy is extremely important. Privacy got into this industry filling a niche where people realize that you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency transactions are all in a public ledger. And guess what? As soon as you identify one and link it to a person, to their identity, you see everything they've ever done on chain. We realized that was a big problem. It was solved. And there's some really amazing players in that space, like Zcash and other privacy technologies. But still, for data privacy, if we talk about bringing Web 2 into Web 3 or in the other direction, there's a massive amount of data. And if you put that into a public commons, you better absolutely have very strong privacy and, and encryption around that. And the other reality we face that a lot of the DLT uh, distributed ledger technology experiments that have been tried have, you know, and maybe fail is the wrong word, but have not had the benefits that the originators thought they would. So, so recycling, guys, we have to address regulation from just a, a practical, professional perspective. We need to be part of the conversation, not completely out of the loop. We need better privacy technologies to make sure that what goes on chain is actually protected, and not just protected today, but protected tomorrow or the many tomorrows that come after, you know, and so that user data is secure and is not being hacked, not being used, used against people, but still is useful. And this is where a special class of cryptography that we specialize in called zero knowledge proofs comes in is we can actually broadcast encrypted information on chain to a public commons and still make use of it without decrypting it. Or having selective decryption to, to parties that you want to be able to decrypt it. We need to familiarize the world with this technology. We cannot expect the world to familiarize themselves. So as we build businesses in the space, education better be at the forefront of what we do. And we have to elucidate very clear, tangible benefits, guys. We can't be talking about philosophy when we're trying to get customers. We need to be able to show them, guys, not only are you saving money here, but we're creating brand new revenue streams for you. That's going to get people into this industry. And then we have the arrogance as an industry to say that enterprise guys come to us, come to our platforms. Well, anytime you talk to someone in, in a large enterprise, they've been pitched thousands of times by different vendors to integrate into their platform. Right? Integration risk is real. It's huge. It's really important. And we need to think about collapsing that and going into their systems. And then again, volatility of cryptocurrencies, guys. Cryptocurrencies are reality. So here, here's my, my quick stance is also you know, my economist hat on. You can't get rid of cryptocurrencies if you want truly decentralized networks because you have to have an asynchronous, continuous payment stream to pay any actor around the world that participates. That, that is what decentralization is in this context, right? And we can talk about levels of decentralization. But to do that, you're not going to be sending bank wires around the world to random people every time they, they forge a block or mine a block. Not going to happen. You have to have a cryptocurrency if decentralization is important to your product or business that you're trying to build. But from a user perspective, from an enterprise perspective, we absolutely should be abstracting away that, that, that touch point. Users should not be touching cryptocurrencies for probably most applications to get on here. And businesses should not have to think about the volatility risk of cryptocurrencies. We can, from a technology perspective and just from an engineering perspective, abstract away these things and put all of that on the back end and automate it. All right. I'm stopping with 30 seconds extra to spare here, guys. Keep that in mind. They're worried I would talk too long. Former professor, I kind of like to get up here and talk. See, you know, former students in the, in the audience. Uh, but guys, we have a great panel now where we'll get some experts. And I'm not going to introduce them all because we have a great uh, MC here, Angie. So I'm going to bring you back on stage. And let's get going. But I'm going to leave uh, the great pictures up here in the meantime. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. And thanks, everybody. Happy Friday. It's time to wake up. Uh, this panel is going to be amazing, I promise you. I have the honor today to share the stage, uh, not only with Rob, uh, the We've met um, over a lot of uh, years now, but also with uh, some other uh, team members of our leadership uh, at Horizon and Horizon Lab. So I would like for you guys to welcome uh, Jordan Kanilov to the stage. Um, he's our VP of, welcome, welcome Jordan, our VP of uh, Strategy and Revenue, and also Saint Cheng, our CTO at Horizon Lab. So welcome. Hmm. Angie, do you want to take the? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. So let's see. I think we want to uh, really drive this conversation as to kind of like where we've uh, been 
uh, in the past and the reasons why uh, of the topic that Rod was talking about, why it has been so challenging for enterprises to adopt this technology, but also I would like for us to focus on some of the solutions and uh, uh, the things that we could do uh, to implement this technology today and in the future. So let's see. Um, let's start. I'll start with Rob. Um, and I would like for us to maybe talk a little bit about what, like, are there any challenges for enterprises uh, besides of the ones you were mentioning, Rob, but more from a financial standpoint. What is your, your point of view on, on that? Yeah, I mean a lot. And, and you got a little bit of a preview for you know, at least the main topics, but you, you've got other ones as well, guys. Is you know, Try to convince a CFO to keep uh, cryptocurrencies on their balance sheet. Right? That's kind of a, something the CFOs don't often like to see or public markets necessarily like to see. That's one. And, and really the guys like also think about from like the internal stakeholder perspective of a large organization and the professionals that have jobs in these organizations, a CIO or some other you know, technology officer in a company is going out on a limb to try to pitch and advocate for bringing this technology into replacing some processes that are working pretty well already. So again, like, like, like I said, we need to think from our perspective in Web3, we need to get into their world, understand their pain points, and actually try to solve these things like a business is supposed to do. Correct. Yeah, I, I do agree uh, completely. So I'd like uh, for Jordan to introduce himself first. So welcome, Jordan. Yeah, thanks very much, Angie. So uh, I'm the VP of Strategy and Revenue at Horizon Labs. And before I joined the blockchain world, I spent most of my career in traditional finance. And one of the main reasons why I, I ended up kind of making the shift into this world was because I worked in this industry that I really felt there were a lot of parts of that could be disrupted by this blockchain technology. And I think that, you know, coming from that world of, of traditional finance and enterprise, I really think that that disruption is going to happen through enterprises. Um, and, and that enterprises are going to be the way that this, you know, onboarding of a billion uh, uh, users is going to happen. Um, I don't think that, you know, overnight you're just going to have every human being in, in the world go in and adopt these technologies without distribution channels. So I really think figuring out how we get enterprises to start being involved and start changing their business models to accept this new reality of what Web3 is going to be is, is going to be just absolutely critical. So Jordan, what are the main pushbacks you've gotten when talking to enterprises or what is it that you hear uh, most uh, frequently? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I'd say they, they fall into two broad categories. So one is lack of education, right? So you got to think about when you're, when you're pitching uh, something to an enterprise, you're speaking to maybe two or three people there, and then you're pitching them, but then they have to go on and pitch it internally and sell it internally in order to, to get somebody to actually take on this new project, right? And when you're going and you're speaking to people, you know, we're all here at a conference. We live, eat, and breathe this stuff. And I'm sure that every single person here has gone down that rabbit hole when you first got started, right? You spend like a month Googling everything and learning all of the terms like L1 and mint and burn and NFTs and consensus. Well, if you're not in that world, this seems very daunting. And it really holds uh, us back in, in the ability for that, you know, an executive feel very comfortable going and pitching the people in their company to go take on a project when they don't fully have a grasp of the relatively you know, complex world of this. So I think that's a big challenge that we're going to face and a challenge that you know, Horizon Labs is not going to solve. It's a challenge that all of us are going to solve. And the more we have conferences like this, the more that people are out there um, and, and the more use cases that people are using in their daily lives, that's going to change. And, and my hope is that you know, we're not a decade away from that, that we're only a couple years away from that. Um, the other area, which is probably the biggest area, is risk, right? And this risk could happen in a lot of ways. You got regulatory risk, you have security risk. You know, people are reading every day about hacks and things like that. They don't want their, their you know, customers to be exposed to things like that. And then, you know, as, as Rob pointed out, there's the integration risk, right? Um, of, you know, asking people to wholesale replace systems that they've been using maybe for 20 or 30 years by some of the, built by some of the biggest corporations in the entire world and switch over to a relatively unproven technology. So handling those risks is really what 
I think you know Horizon Labs is focused on, and I, and I hope that a lot of other players on the in the industry are focused on, which is transitioning to Web 3 with this Web 2.5, right? It's not about replacing your legacy systems, it's about augmenting them with a new technology that works better in certain applications, right? Um, and it's also about um, doing this kind of stepwise approach. Like one of the things you know, we really focus on is, is building out these, um, uh, with our architecture, the, these side chains that can be private and permissioned, right? And a, an enterprise can build out a Web 3 backend uh, without having to expose themselves to regulatory risk of being on a public and permissionless chain, but with the ability in the future to make it public and permissionless. Um, and you know, the, the pitch there is basically like, this is the future, it's coming, get ready for it. You may as well start building your infrastructure, start understanding you know, what you need to do in terms of changing your business model, and don't be left flat-footed, so. Amazing, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I think something that I really like that you mentioned at the beginning, Jordan, was like the part of like education. Like there's really, there's, there really needs like, I think all of us, we share this kind of like face when we were like literally doing research on our own and a lot of due diligence. Like we started there. Like either me or Rob or anyone here, if you're already familiar and kind of like inside this world, like you know that you had to do a lot of research and like really try to answer those questions uh, on a personal level, level, on a professional level, right? And how these things can apply to companies, industries, ecosystems, um, you name it, right? So I, I think that's always something that's key. And in this industry for me, uh, being in this industry for the past seven years, pretty much since the beginning of my professional career, I have to say that I've never stopped learning. This is something fundamental. So uh, whether you're um, running a company or whether you're, I don't know, using this for, uh, as a personal um, use case, right? You always have to try to be on top and kind of like get yourself educated as to what is, what is it that is coming, right? So I, I really like that, that point. So I'd like to give the word now to Zane, our CTO, and for him to introduce himself. So welcome, Zane. Yeah, thanks, Angie, and hey, everyone. I'm Zane, CTO of Horizon Labs. I love geeking out about tech and also utilizing tech in enterprises, the real world. Uh, I oversee all things technology related. I'm based in New York City, where we have offices. Uh, we have offices in New York City as well as Milan and all over the world. Um, we have a really talented team uh, that has helped us do many of the successful launches that Rob has already mentioned on the smart contract side, uh, our upcoming ZK products, as well as uh, yeah, our new EVM compatible sidechain, Eon, all really exciting, exciting things. And wouldn't be up here without the support of our incredible technology team. I'm very grateful for them. And uh, yeah. Just, uh, it's just one thing to be able to be on this tech, uh, tech journey with others who share uh, in that spirit, the spirit of crypto. So excited to be here. Amazing. Yes, welcome, Sane. So let's see, a question that I have here for you is maybe for you to tell us a little bit about like, why past efforts uh, have not generally succeeded. Like, what's your, your take on, on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with past efforts for enterprises, uh, a lot of what Rob said around financial risk, what Jordan said uh, around risk all over. Um, and I want to underscore the part about, from a tech side, integration risk. I mean, uh, I liked what the phrase that Jordan used, like Web 2.5, that kind of like stepwise approach to Web 3. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, existing companies now, they, they do have systems older systems that they're working with. And they're stuck. They're stuck in the status quo. And they want to move to Web3. It's not easy to move to Web3, uh, because just like any emerging tech, uh, there's all the risks that were mentioned. Uh, but then like doing the, the actual execution of moving from Web2 to Web3, uh, a company could get stuck on small things uh, that could, uh, you know, whether it's business processes or anything related to uh, the IT uh, aspect of it as well. So creating that bridge, that's the way to really get past the past efforts. Uh, and that could be partnering. Partnering with folks who are already in Web3, who can help with uh, all the nuances that are needed to like, take a tech stack, 
where they are now to where they need to be. Amazing. And I guess another, another question, kind of like just the opposite. From your point of view, what has worked so far at getting enterprises onto the blockchain, or what have you seen that it's working for them from your perspective? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to go on uh, what was said before is that um, in that partner, like that partnership with a blockchain startup, uh, creating these proof, proof of concepts that are uh, bridges from where they are now to where they will be. Uh, but like actually maturing the proof of concept. So uh, it's one thing to just you know, see, hey, this is working, but it's another thing to make it uh, a reality, a reality with production systems, a reality with all the different other systems that they need to uh, uh, network with, as well as on the regulatory side as well. Amazing. Now, I was mentioning like, okay, what's, what has happened in the past? Like the, the story, like where, where we were like thinking in the past, but now looking towards the future and focusing on adoption, I would like to ask Rob from a privacy perspective, how can CTEC provide value added to these companies? Yeah, so I, I alluded to it in my talk that like uh, zero knowledge cryptography is a key part of this, but there's also other elements of cryptography that are absolutely key. The point is to make sure that you know what needs to be protected, what needs to be secure and private is right. And like, let's not get obsessed with a particular like type of technology. But we did choose as a company uh, some time ago that the most promising element to get something on chain is zero knowledge cryptography because of the homomorphic properties of just its construction. And what I mean by that is you can broadcast information encrypted to a public ledger, and you can still make use of that information you know, without decrypting it. That's absolutely huge. Then the other element that I think is going to be key for business systems coming on chain is to have certain access control rights. So you can broadcast uh, information encrypted and have, say, like a viewing key for, I don't know, like a, a part of your supply chain, a viewing key for maybe a, another office, maybe like a member of a consortium that you're part of, maybe a regulator, maybe a tax authority. I know bad words in, in the world of crypto, but it's the reality that we live in, right? So this is that class of cryptography that we specialize in, we've built in the capabilities, because we think this is that bridge, right? Like the, the opening salvo with Bitcoin, you know, the open, you know, in terms of creating, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency, that was huge. You know, layering a, a virtual machine onto a blockchain, what Ethereum did, absolutely huge. They've created a brand new standard. So if you're thinking about smart contracting, and we learned this probably, you know, just recently, we're in process of launching our own Ethereum-compatible smart contracting chain because we realized there was a standard, an emergent standard, the Ethereum standard. But going beyond that, guys, actually getting business systems on chain, and not all should be on chain. Not every database should be dumped on a blockchain, but maybe databases should be encrypted with you know other types of cryptography, like fully homomorphic encryption and proofs of you know, these databases or information from databases should be broadcast on chain into the information commons when and where they make sense and it can actually be utilized once they're there. So it really is the early stage for bringing this technology now from just the raw cryptocurrency or smart contracting world into the broader, you know, Web2 or whatever you want to call it, business world. We're there now. We're at that nexus. The technologies are in place. The foundations are in place. And now we need to systematically chip away against the hurdles and, and like real you know, roadblocks that are out there or pain points to bring this technology into the public domain. Amazing. I, I think, I don't know, one of my favorite use cases for like privacy focus, it would be private voting. Like I think there's a, a still a lot of areas of opportunity in that front. And I think through like CK technology and like C, uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, we can really build some really interesting use cases for private voting, whether that's in a company, in a small corporation, in a government. There's still a lot of areas of opportunity in there. It's one of my favorite use cases uh, to, to explore. So I'd like to ask Sane now, um, how can companies enhance their security using blockchain technology? Yeah, yeah. I mean, with blockchain, it is, there are many elements of security because, hey, it is immutable. And it's tamper-proof. It's not easy to go in and say, hey, I'm going to edit something on the blockchain and I'm going to delete it. It's all there, and it does help enhance security. And some of the things, uh, Rob has mentioned information commons a few times, and the blockchain can be this secure medium of exchange, a way to collaborate between enterprises. Things like viewing keys, 
access control. Uh, it allows for c companies that would have collaborated uh, in a web two way by sharing information uh, through uh, transit. There's a risk to sharing information via transit. You could get lost. It could fall in the wrong hands. Uh, but having that secure medium, medium in blockchain, being able to control that and uh, have access control protected by cryptography, uh, that can really help with the security uh, of, for a company. Love it, love it. Um, now to Jordan, what, what do you think are like, some of the most, uh, um, let's say, attractive use cases that companies or enterprises could, could adopt these days? Yeah, so you know, with that, I, I think that um, one thing we keep on hearing with uh, Web3 is that it's going to empower the, the creator economy, right? Um, and when we think about that, we think of like, you know, uh, artists or, or, or uh, people creating content on social media platforms. But at the end of the day, a lot of creation is done by enterprises, right? Um, brands pre create goods and things like that. And one of the use cases that, that we've been digging in a lot on, which I find really interesting, is the idea of a, um, a digital marketplace, a digital physical marketplace. And I think that this will actually uh, be a new paradigm in, in retail as well as a new paradigm in the creator economy. And basically, you know, the way to think about it is uh, for many, many eons, um, uh, you would produce something, a good, or if you're an artist, you'd produce a piece of art, and you would sell it. And you have that primary sale, and you'd make revenue off of that primary sale. After that, if it's the type of good that might increase in value or that speculators might be interested in, beyond that, you're not seeing any revenue, right? The, the speculators are making the revenue, and the platforms for the speculators are making the revenue. Now that we have the ability to you know, have a digital representation of a f physical good, and with NFTs to be able to put in royalty streams within those um, quite easily, I think that's going to be a massive change. Uh, you're going to find these types of goods that, that will, or, or artist creations, that have that, that uh, ability to increase in value over time being released in digital format, right? And then the speculators are going to be able to uh, speculate and trade that in digital format. Now all of a sudden the creator gets a, a chunk of all of those secondary sales. And then finally when you have that person who is a collector who wants that item for, for the long term, they can then burn that digital form, trigger a supply chain event, and be sent the physical form uh, of that item uh, by the actual creator, right? Um, to me, that's a massive change. That's something that changes the way business has been done um, or cre you know, creator economy has worked for, for generations. Um, and I think that's going to be something that you're going to see over and over again. Um, and it's something that you know, we're really going out there and speaking to a lot of enterprises and getting a lot of um, uh, you know, interest in because it's a win-win for all three uh, you know, participants, right? You know, the, if you're the creator, you're getting new income streams, you're, you're increasing your margin. If you're the speculator, it's a lot easier. You don't need to take physical possession of something. You don't need to have the risk of, you know, shipping and, and uh, the risk of uh, people being uh, unhappy with what you're sending. And then for the collector, I mean, I'm sure we've all had that experience where we bought something online and we're just not sure if it's real or not, right? And you just gotta trust it. Like, okay, that guy on eBay sent it, selling me the real thing, maybe, maybe not, right? But if you're going to be able to you know, buy a digital form, burn it, and then receive that physical item directly from the manufacturer or from the artist, that's a big, big change. So it's a win-win all around, and we need to find more of those in order to get enterprises and users adopting this technology, because it's powerful. Love it, love it. I, yesterday uh, in our booth here, I was talking to uh, one friend of mine uh, from Mexico and uh, we were talking about this kind of like use cases like for example, I think proof of authenticity from NFTs, it's something that still has a lot of areas uh, of opportunity and a lot of potential. Like let's say if you have a watch, whatever the brand of the watch is, you would need to have some sort of like proof that that is real, right? Not only from the certificates that they give you, but if what if you lost them or you, I don't know, like something happens, you could still have that as an NFT. You could still have that as a, I don't know, for example, like any maintenance or, or kind of like uh, how to keep your, your jewelry or, or watch 
um, in a good condition so you could have the proof that is still uh, authentic, that uh, you're like giving some maintenance to it, the proof that it's yours, so proof of ownership. And that, the whole thing around that is like a use case that companies and enterprises could benefit from, from let's say NFTs, right? So we go beyond just like profile picture images and things like that. So to me, it's like a really interesting use case. And then we were also, we were also talking about how you can like even bundle these NFTs and turn it into one as to kind of like the unique proof of like, hey, you know, my watch is original or whatever it is, right? Whatever. Uh, possession that you may have that you want to prove that is yours, that is authentic, and and that is uh, the original, right? For example, so I, I do love those those use cases. Uh, uh, so just wanted to to highlight that. So a question to Rob, and now we're getting into the final three questions. Um, and I really kind of like thought of this like from different perspectives because we always talk about scalability. So from a, a scalability standpoint, Rob, uh, how do you think this would benefit institutions? Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm going to start off by throwing out like a, a, a hypothesis here. My hypothesis is that over time, blockchains are going to be commoditized. You know, just the example I always throw out there is that like when you're on a Zoom call, you could care less what ISP your data packets are routing over. I think that's probably where this industry is going to go, despite the tribalism and everything that's out there right now. So the way I think that's going to evolve is that we're going to create efficient and like important and useful settlement layers using this technology. And then different businesses, different projects, different governments will plug in and route information you know, th that suits form and function across there. But what it gives for you know, these businesses, why would they even do it? Well, one benefit is you're offloading the cost of your infrastructure. So you know, for developers out there or you know, technology-heavy companies, your cloud costs are probably a really big part of your, your cost structure for what you're doing, right? especially startups. And I know there are programs out there that lower those costs. But imagine like this technology creates, again, this information commons. I like to keep hammering that point. But it's a public infrastructure. It's like a public good out there, like a cloud, that you can just tap into. The costs of the cloud are being you know, borne by the participants of that ecosystem. Now, I, I envision a world where these different ecosystems, they're probably going to converge on standards. I talked about the Ethereum standard. And then they're probably going to all, and there'll probably be other standards that will emerge over time, guys, right? That, again, form and function, they should have real value out there. Uh, not innovation for the sake of innovation, and they'll probably all be interoperable with each other. At least the important ones will be interoperable, and this will probably be that kind of like broad, you know, a public commons environment that your participants can just plug into and then focus on their application layer and not worry about the infrastructure stuff. Yes, yes. Now, uh, a question for Sane. What do you think, Sane, are the, the, let's say, the most common challenges that enterprises face uh, when trying to adopt this into their business models. Yeah, yeah. From a technology perspective, the challenges for enterprises could include very small, like uh, foundational items, meaning that every enterprise has their identity management system. You know, they they have one that's internal, but then they're integrating Facebook ID, and then there's Google ID. There's all these um, nuances, and now there's crypto wallets. How do you integrate that? And uh, you know, roadblocks like that with existing systems uh, can be foundational. But then there could be smaller ones where, hey, I can't get past this firewall for X and can't do this. Uh, that are just they just need to be done. And then there's uh, business processes. Business processes that, right, are are there because of uh, the sat status quo. And you could have a smart contract go in and automate the whole thing. Uh, what would happen there? So someone has to go in and uh, think about all these nuances. They'll be different with each time, but with every iteration uh, and a lot of development and uh, a lot of innovation is uh, iteration. So navigating through that change, navigating through any change, uh, it does take uh, like care and nuance, um, and, but for the greater good. I mean, the public co commons concept, in public infrastructure, for companies, it's a very powerful one, and I'm really excited to usher it through. I like it. I like it, and I have to say, like, something that is like kind of like my my key takeaway from what you mentioned, saying is like iteration. And I think even ourselves within the company, we're seeing this like iteration phases that we're implementing right on our different deliveries uh, uh, to testnet of our own EVM right now. 
So I think it it's, has to be like in an incremental, let's say, uh, movement and steps versus just trying to embrace something all at once. It's like adoption takes time, and I think this is also important for us, but also for the companies out there that might not be very familiar with the technology. So I think iteration is key. Okay, so the last question I have for Jordan um, would be for, for you, Jordan, to share with us, like what industries do you think Web3 will make the most impact in uh, three years from now, or let's say in the near future? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the answer from the near future might be a little bit different from, from the long-term future. With the near future, the ones that come to mind first, um, video game industry. Um, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of video game companies being very interested in understanding how they can use Web3 to engage with their, with their customers. And, you know, you often hear the, the use case of, okay, we're going to create an in-game item, make it an, an, an NFT, and then you're going to be able to bring that to other games. That might not be the only use case, and there's a lot of issues around that use case, and we've been doing a lot of research into other things, and I really think you're going to end up seeing a lot in the video game industry around uh, digital rights management, around the idea of putting the games themselves and making those into NFTs so that you can make it e easier marketplaces for secondhand um, uh, sales of it. Um, so I think that's one area, and I think that's going to be a big area just because they're a brave industry in wanting to, to really be in the forefront here, and, and we're seeing you know, a lot of interest there. The other one um, is one that's already probably been, been the industry that's, that's adopted this the most, which is the financial industry. So you know, that's my background. I've spent uh, a long time in my career in the financial industry. And ultimately, you know, if you look at the financial industry over the last like, you know, 40, 50 years, what the financial industry mostly does is acts as an intermediary between two parties that don't trust each other, right? And they used to take a little cut to, to be that intermediary, and over time that cut has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, I call it a, you know, a, a rent-seeking uh, intermediary. It, it, it is taking more value than it's giving, right? And one of the reasons why I got into this industry was I immediately realized this technology, the thing it's probably best at is taking two parties that don't trust each other and allowing them to exchange things in a trustless manner, right? So, you know, with that, um, there is one good thing about the finance industry. Everybody's focused on the bottom line and they're very capitalistic. So they're not worried about cannibalizing their own business because there's always somebody out there trying to make, uh, you know, an extra buck out of it. So I really think that we're going to start seeing even more breakthroughs on the finance industry that is going to, you know, hurt the big players but will really help all of the rest of us. And when I say all of the rest of us, it's not just individuals with bank accounts. That's companies too, you know? Companies spend a lot of money on finance, right? Um, so I, I think it's really going to be a value unlock for global growth, actually. Um, and, and that's one I'm really excited about. The final one that, that I'd mention is the media and entertainment industry. I touched on this a little bit about um, the creator economy, right? This is a tidal wave that's happening, right? The, the, especially like in, in a younger generation, right? They are growing up with, with this idea that they own the content they create and it's not just these massive Web2 platforms that own it, right? And that's something that media and entertainment companies, especially the forward-thinking ones, know that they have to get into and have to uh, really you know, be on top of. Um, so it, I think that the ones that get in now that start trying to figure out what their new business models are around a different paradigm in, in, in what they do in, in terms of the, the content creation side are really going to be the winners. And the ones that are you know, stuck in the Web2 world and are just going to wait for this to, to hit them, they're going to be in trouble. So. Um, with that, I'd, I'd say those are the three that I'm most excited about. Yeah, yeah, agree, agree. And uh, yeah, so um, I mean, just some clo uh, closing thoughts. We're right here in booth 713. Please come and reach out to us. We have a lot of our team members uh, here, and we would be more than happy to talk to you about like if you have uh, a company, you're running an enterprise or a company, how you can start adopting uh, blockchain technology, how 
can you like build use cases that maybe would adapt to your business models? We're more than happy to talk to you, so just come and reach out to us, or just come by and say hello if you're already in, in Web3 and crypto. Uh, we always love to see familiar faces and friends around. Uh, so I guess that's it for today. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope that you like this uh, session, and thank you for thank you, my Angie. speakers.